Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. Andrew is off. Tonight, he dismissed the risk of COVID-19. Now the president of Brazil is infected. Still, Jair Bolsonaro is defiant. We are all vulnerable to this virus. As the pandemic surges, some countries lock down again. Toronto and Ottawa make masks mandatory. I'm grateful that they have done it, finally. Should other cities do the same? Cracking down on foreign puppy mills. Canada bans imports from Ukraine, but is it enough? I'd like to see where Canada plans to make the changes permanent. Will we ever shake hands again? So are you prepared to not shake hands for the next two years, possibly? Absolutely. What's lost without that simple human gesture? This is The National. Canada's fight against COVID-19 is generally going well, but look beyond our borders and the global picture's troubling. From the World Health Organization today, a warning that we are nowhere near the end. The outbreak is accelerating, and we have clearly not reached the peak of the pandemic. Some parts of the world that were opening up are now shutting down again as cases surge. Of particular concern, Latin America where the WHO says both cases and deaths are rising. And there today, a very high-profile positive case. Brazil's president, Jair Bolsonaro. Now, Brazil has the second-highest case count in the world, 1.6 million and counting. Bolsonaro has been downplaying the risk of this virus since the start. And as Breyer Stewart shows us, his diagnosis hasn't changed that. Even as Jair Bolsonaro confirmed he had COVID-19, the Brazilian president took off his mask and boasted. You can see from my face that I'm well, he said. For those who want to go get checked, you won't have a problem. It's hardly surprising that Bolsonaro has tested positive for the virus. It's ravaging Brazil, and the president has been dismissing the risk for months. Mingling in large crowds and urging Brazilians to go back to work. No meu caso particular. He previously said that given his history of athleticism, if he were to be infected, he wouldn't have to worry. Today, officials with the World Health Organization, which Bolsonaro has labeled as incompetent, wished him well. The virus doesn't really know who we are, uh, whether we're prince or pauper, uh, we're equally vulnerable. Bolsonaro started feeling ill on Sunday, one day after he socialized with the U.S. ambassador during July 4 celebrations. He says he's taking hydroxychloroquine, a drug which hasn't been proven to be effective against the virus. In front of his residence today, there was a show of support, but on the street, some weren't sympathetic. He said it was a little flu, and now he has to live with this little flu, said this man. Bolsonaro, ever confident and confrontational, has polarized the country. His supporters adore him, but others protest his handling of the pandemic. In the spring, he fired one health minister and another one resigned. I think um, from a public health point of view, it's uh, very worrying because he set a terrible example. Uh, a lot of Brazilians believe that the uh, pandemic is not as serious. But yet the virus is tearing through cities and remote regions. The death toll throughout the country continues to climb. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. As cases climb worldwide, some countries are moving to reimpose lockdowns. In Israel, the government is shutting down bars, gyms and nightclubs and restricting the number of people in synagogues and on buses. Israel is now seeing as many as 1,000 new cases a day. Today, the country's top public health official resigned, saying leaders ignored the warnings and reopened too quickly. And some states in the U.S. are imposing restrictions as the country continues to inch closer to 3 million cases. Nearly 50,000 Americans tested positive in the last 24 hours, many in Texas. That state saw more than 10,000 new cases in a single day. After a spike in March, Australia managed to flatten its COVID curve through April, May and almost all of June and then a flare up. And as Chris Brown explains, that is pushing the country's second largest city, Melbourne, back into lockdown. Thank you very much. Where are we coming from today? 
Police are patrolling the busy state line between Victoria and New South Wales, now closed for the first time in a century. And Melbourne is headed into another lockdown. At this public housing complex, the epicenter of 70 new cases, there were scuffles for food. 4,000 people, including Thana Sarag, can't leave their apartments. We called the hotline. We said, hey, we need sanitary pads. We need, um, we need milk, we need groceries. Victoria's premier said people let their guard down. I think a sense of complacency has crept into us as we let our frustrations get the better of us. I think that each of us knows someone who has not been following the rules as well as they should have. You always gave a ride. Good. Much of the finger pointing is focused on quarantine hotels where the virus likely escaped from. This family who returned from India says the room they moved into obviously wasn't cleaned properly. We found um, other people here in the bed sheets, nails on a carpet, um, some food particles and food wrappers under the bed. The 191 new cases reported Tuesday in Victoria may not be a lot by international standards, but what's worrying is the trend is headed back up, says this Canadian expert. As people begin to think they've got it beat, as things are loosening up, the virus which has been dampened but not eradicated will come back up again. Closing the state border is creating logistical nightmares. People in communities that straddle the line need permits to cross, to shop or work. This is something entirely different. This is going to affect the travel of my staff because I have staff and clients on living and working on both sides of the border. As for Melbourne, long lineups returned outside grocery stores. It's back to essential trips only outside the home. Australia's halting economic recovery from COVID is on pause. Chris Brown, CBC News, Vancouver. So all of this probably has you wondering, how's Canada doing? Well, let's look at today's numbers. Across the country, there were 232 new cases, making the number of active ones more than 27,000. British Columbia accounted for 12 today. Again, Quebec and Ontario led the way. Quebec reporting 60, Ontario 112. And in that province, some cities are taking nothing for granted. Today, making mask wearing mandatory in indoor public spaces. Thomas Degler explains. Just months ago, it would have seemed draconian. But today, in Canada's biggest city, the shift to mandatory masks appeared seamless. I think it's a good thing. I'm grateful that they have done it, finally. From Toronto's St. Lawrence Market to Adam Picard's hair salon. If you don't want to wear a mask, you can't be in here, you can't get your hair cut. It's up to managers to ensure their customers wear a face covering. That goes for any indoor public space, including the library, where the mayor explained the new role of business owners. They can simply say, no shoes, no shirt, no face covering, no service. And I think by doing that, uh, most stores will make it clear. Similar rules came into effect in Ottawa with exemptions for people with some health conditions and children under two but not Theodore. He touches it, but he will keep it on. And for a three-year-old, I think that's pretty good. At this pharmacy, the owner does expect some pushback, having seen the anti-mask chatter on social media. I am prepared to turn away business. Unfortunately, it's uh, something I think it's essential. Those fringe activists or anti-maskers took to the Toronto subway, their faces uncovered despite a rule requiring masks our choice and you're not going to take that away from us. In these two cities, at least, it is now in fact not your decision to make. While there may be fewer cases, there is more consensus. It's not really a choice anymore. You, you've got to put a mask on. If people wear masks, they can prevent the transmission of this infection to others. Here in Toronto, the requirement will remain in effect until at least the end of September. Other nearby cities and Montreal will soon follow suit. And Quebec is considering making masks mandatory for indoor public spaces across the whole province. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. Now, masks were already mandatory at Toronto's Pearson Airport, but Conservative leader Andrew Scheer and Manitoba Premier Brian Pallister were spotted there today without their faces covered. The pair seen here at a departure gate in a clear violation of the airport's rules. Scheer's office says he removed his mask to make a phone call, while Pallister called the moment a lapse in judgment. The World Health Organization is acknowledging COVID-19 may be spread through the air. 
We believe that we have to be open uh, to this evidence and understand its implications regarding the modes of transmission. So this comes after hundreds of scientists wrote an open letter outlining evidence showing smaller particles, not just larger droplets, can linger and infect people. The Trump administration has begun the process of withdrawing from the WHO. The president made his intentions clear to leave in May, accusing the organization of bowing to Chinese influence in the wake of the pandemic. The process could take at least a year. Trump has also been leaning into racial divisions in recent days, trying to get reelected by playing to the base that got him into the White House. But as Katie Simpson explains, some in his own party call this a bad strategy. The president of the United States. At a roundtable discussion on reopening schools, the president cracked much. a joke about one of the most Vaccines sensitive issues in the well, country while addressing the governor well, of Missouri. You won't be changing the name St. Louis, will you? No, huh? we will not be doing that. Thank you. That's Thank a quip you know, about the important. heated divisions Thank over whether to rename military bases and remove statues dedicated to Confederate leaders who fought to defend slavery. It comes as Donald Trump's social media posts on issues of race draw criticism from members of his party who Never say he's undermining the re-election message he delivered in his 4th of July speech. The question is, did what the president tweeted on Monday advance the cause that he laid out on Saturday? And I think the answer is an unambiguous no. On Monday, Trump attacked Bubba Wallace, NASCAR's only black driver, after a hate crime investigation into what appeared to be a noose found hanging in his garage turned out to be a coincidence. The president called it a hoax, saying that and the decision to ban the Confederate flag caused lowest ratings ever. This anti-Trump Republican strategist says this is a way to distract from the president's handling of the pandemic. It seems to me that the president is more concerned about saying, just forget American public, what a disaster this has been on our shores. And look over here. Members of the administration are sidestepping questions on the tweet, with one downplaying racism in the U.S. I live my life in, in, in a race-blind world. It, it troubles me that, that we have so much of this discussion uh, when, in fact, we've got real, real problems in in this country. Trump's latest tweets do not appear to be helping him to grow his base. Instead, they're widely seen as a way to motivate his core supporters and get them to the polls this fall. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Winnipeg police are investigating after two protesters were attacked with a hockey stick following a Black and Indigenous Lives Matter rally on Saturday. Two videos show a woman getting out of a car and going after protesters, and one of them being hit in the head. One of the victims says it started after he lay down in the road as an act of protest, leading to shouting from the car and to him throwing water on it. A witness gave police the license plate. In Saskatchewan, an independent investigation is underway after the violent arrest of an Indigenous man. A video shows the man being repeatedly punched, then tasered. As the CBC's Bonnie Allen reports, there are questions about how and why it all escalated to that point. Stop resisting! In a six-minute video, a Saskatoon police officer struggles to subdue and handcuff Evan Penner. When Penner tries to wrestle free, the officer punches him repeatedly. Stop grabbing my leg! Stop grabbing my arm! Frank Collins lives nearby and started recording. I yelled out to the officer to, to you know, that's not necessary, please stop doing that. Um, the officer uh, acknowledged my presence um, and at that point uh, started yelling, uh, stop resisting, stop resisting, and continued to, to throw punches. Penner persistently tries to fight free. Seven more officers arrive and he's tasered, punched, and pepper sprayed. Police were called about a suspicious person when Penner started dousing himself with someone's water hose. Lorraine Salt let him sit on her front step and wonders how it all escalated to violence. He seemed, you know, a little bit happy to find the shade and a place to sit down. With every encounter, there has to be a thinking of how can I de-escalate this? Former Supreme Court Judge Frank Iacobucci has studied use of force. He says in some cases it can be reasonable for an officer to punch someone to subdue them. But you'd also want to judge what happened before it 
came to that stage. The officer has been placed on leave. Some want him fired. But indigenous and black people are still routinely brutalized by the police in this city um, with no accountability at all. So I believe that the police should be fired. Both the Saskatoon Police Service and Police Association say the video does not capture the entire interaction. He's hurting me. Just comply. The association also says Penner had been arrested earlier in the day for alleged indecent exposure and was released. Saskatoon's mayor is calling for a review of police training as it relates to de-escalation and use of force. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. Now to Halifax, where charges have been dropped against a black woman who was tackled by police in a Walmart and accused of stealing about $6 worth of produce. But that's not what she was charged for. Kayla Hounsell explains. Justice for Santino Reyes! Santino Reyes supporters gathered outside a Halifax court. They have been lobbying Nova Scotia's public prosecution to drop the charges against her. Today, it did, saying there was no realistic prospect of conviction and no public interest in proceeding. I'm just so incredibly incredibly overwhelmed. Rayo was shopping at Walmart when the police showed up. She says she was racially profiled and accused of trying to steal a head of lettuce, two lemons and a grapefruit. The items were in the bottom of her stroller because she had her hands full. I'm on the phone with my, my mom and I'm standing in the toy aisle with my two kids. My son's in the stroller, my daughter is three. Rayo suffered a concussion, bruising and a broken wrist. She was detained and charged with causing a disturbance, assaulting a peace officer and resisting arrest. Um, complete freedom from this instance would be that the police involved would be held accountable and that Walmart would also be held accountable. Um, Rayo says she now plans to sue Walmart and the Halifax Regional Municipality. Nova Scotia's police watchdog is also investigating. Rayo's lawyer says he hopes the complaints and legal action will contribute to the larger conversation about how police treat people of color. She was still shopping for heaven's sake. There was no crime being committed. They should have known there was no crime. There was no In a statement, Halifax's police chief said, I want to acknowledge the hurt this incident has caused to all involved. We will learn from this incident and improve as an organization. Rayo says she and her children, especially her daughter, have suffered a great deal due to the actions of police. As a child that's almost four, her vision and ideal of police is brutality. And that was not my own doing, that was their doing. Her advice to others who feel they have been racially profiled? Don't be ashamed to speak up. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. A black woman who worked for the WE charity is speaking exclusively to CBC News to describe how the group rewrote her own experience with racism. WE has been making news because of a controversial federal contract. Farah Morali has this new angle. Are you ready to change this world? WE charity is well known for youth empowerment and close ties to influential people. But now this former employee paints a different picture. I felt like I was sinking in sand. Amanda Maitland was asked to speak on a 2019 WE anti-racism tour in Alberta. She says she wrote her own speech and started the tour. But on a brief return to Toronto, she says she was called into a meeting. I was literally put a new speech on the table and told that there, there had to be changes. It was completely watered down. Um, it wanted me to talk about cornrows and wanted me to talk about the Oscars and the language was just completely different. The changes, she says, came from a team of nearly all white WE employees. CBC News spoke to 15 former WE employees. Several confirmed they knew Maitland's speech was changed. Most described what they called, quote, culture of fear within the organization. Rhea Carey says she experienced that fear. Never in my life before had I felt like unsure about my opinion, my values, and where I stand because of how they made it seem like I was negative. So first and foremost... One Maitland's story, which she first shared on Instagram, has now sparked a flurry of other testimonials. I'm speaking out about it because I'm, I've left the organization. I too need to speak up about my experiences that way. I'm disgusted and enraged. After CBC News reached out to the charity, we co-founders Craig and Mark Kielberger apologized publicly to Maitland, saying, you shared in your video that the words of your speech were altered. It simply should not have happened. 
In a separate statement about an alleged culture of fear, we told CBC, we members can anonymously submit on a feedback portal. Any concerns or issues they have. I need to know that it's coming from a genuine place. That apology was also sent to Maitland personally. But for now, she says she's taking time to reflect on the words. Farah Morali, CBC News, Toronto. The Trudeau government's following through on an agreement with the Assembly of First Nations, signing a pledge to make them responsible for child welfare, but there's no money and no timeline. Olivia Stefanovic tells us that has left some advocates deeply skeptical. The simple joy of a splash pad on a hot summer day, something Rochelle Matadawabin never knew until her daughter Mila arrived. I just didn't understand anything. I didn't understand why I couldn't just live in a healthy home. Matatawaban was placed in the child welfare system months after she was born. Shuffled to so many foster homes, she lost track. She wonders how her life would have been different if she stayed in Fort Albany First Nation and was brought up in her own culture. Children and youth don't have families to rely on, right? So if the funding actually gets given to Indigenous communities, I really have high hopes that they will know, that we will know what to do. That's the goal behind a new agreement between Ottawa and the Assembly of First Nations. It's a plan to come up with a plan on how to fund the new First Nation-run child welfare system. Any level of government cannot argue with that, putting the needs of the children first. But Ottawa is not offering up any new money or committing to any deadlines. The fact that there's no binding commitment of funding, it means that things aren't going to change when they ought to change. The minister admits transferring control of the foster care system to First Nations won't be easy. And so that's a long-term, um, a long-term and probably a very painful process. But it's one all parties agree is necessary to reduce the number of Indigenous youth in care. There are now more in the foster system than at the height of the residential school era. Matatawabin is hopeful the announcement is more than words. It's how many years of this? I think we've all had enough and, and we should never have been waiting this long. Because as Matatawabin knows all too well, children only get one chance at a decent childhood. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Ottawa. Mass puppy mills are thriving in Eastern Europe, sending dogs here. Today, Ottawa took a step banning puppies from Ukraine. Up next, why activists say the ban doesn't go nearly far enough. Plus, remember these? In the post-pandemic world, how do we greet each other? How do we connect with each other? We're not seeing people, we're seeing like vectors of transmission. Plus, break and enter with the cause. When I'd seen this and I'm like totally reduced to tears, uh, yeah, it just blew me away. A committed community's quiet helping hands. We're back in two. Floods in southern Japan have killed at least 55 people. A dozen were reported missing, and more rain is on the way. More than a million people have been forced out of their homes. And temperatures in the Siberian Arctic hit record averages last month. New data revealed some areas saw rises of as much as 10 degrees Celsius. Scientists said that helped fuel recent wildfires in the region, and they called the trend a warning cry. The Canadian agency responsible for the health of animals took a small step today to protect some imported puppies from harm. As David Common explains, a recent incident showed just how serious that harm can be. More than 500 puppies were crammed into the cargo hold of a flight landing in Toronto just three weeks ago. Nearly a day after those dogs were crammed into dozens of crates in Ukraine, believed to be the work of puppy mills selling to Canadians seeking a dog fast. 38 of the puppies died in transit. At least one purportedly left in this bag. Ukraine International Airlines now tells CBC News it will temporarily suspend the transportation of animals on long-haul flights. And today, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency targeted the lucrative puppy trade in Canada by stopping the importation of commercial puppies under eight months of age from Ukraine. It's going to be harder for them, but 
this is only temporary, so I'd like to see where Canada plans to make the changes permanent and not just to the Ukraine, um, to the other countries that are in consideration and behind this as well. Indeed, the federal action is not permanent, only targets commercial importation and it still permits any number of puppies, even from puppy mills in other Eastern European countries. It's a big business. Just look at Toronto's Kijiji listings, puppies for two and three thousand dollars. We need to overall ban the commercial importation of dogs for sale into Canada. We already have our own thriving puppy mill industry, sadly, here in Canada. And we don't need to add by actually bringing more animals in from other countries that are coming from puppy mills. But that's not what the feds have done, targeting only the most recent and disastrous import. David Common, CBC News, Toronto. Next on The National, remember handshakes? When's the next time you think you'll be okay to shake on it? We're being told that touch is dangerous. What our brain thinks is people are dangerous, others are dangerous. What is that message doing to how we interact with each other long term? Plus, what to expect when you go in for testing. Andrew shows us what it's like getting tested for COVID-19. So add this to the long, long list of ways this pandemic has changed us. With a handshake considered too high risk, greeting by elbow has sort of gone mainstream. In practice, it's just a minor change, but the handshake is about so much more than just saying hi. It's about showing trust, too, and it's personal. So how to fill that void now and for as long as this lasts? We went searching for some answers. Take a moment for a little time travel, back to forever ago, March 2nd. <laughs> and German Chancellor Angela Merkel going in for a handshake. Funny how the whole idea of not shaking hands was just so hard to get used to then. And yet, we adapt. Even a president known for practically weaponizing the handshake now seems horrified by an outstretched hand. Once routine behaviors, no longer routine. There is a tendency of some folks to use it as a demonstration of power. To stop and so a nagging question for a specialist in organizational behavior. Will we ever shake on it again? What would it take for you to feel comfortable to shake a hand again? It would take a highly effective, easily available vaccine or a super effective treatment for the coronavirus for me to be comfortable again. So are you prepared to not shake hands for the next two years, possibly? Absolutely. This gesture has been with us for millennia, survived even the Black Plague. People stopped kissing on the cheek for hundreds of years then, but they kept shaking hands. An endearing, enduring greeting, now paused, but likely not gone, because apparently we need it. And it's a need to establish trust with one another. And the way the handshake allows you to establish trust is by one, showing that you hold nothing dangerous in your hand. But not every culture does this. That's true. Cultures that substitute, replace the handshake with gestures like the namaste uh, or the bow emphasize different things. Those are gestures that really speak more to respect and deference toward the other, but they don't establish that warmth that deep sense of closeness. It's a talk we're having in the Financial District of Toronto because for the next few years without handshakes, interactions in those gleaming towers will have to change and get more personal. And the best way to establish that you mean well is to take a real interest in the other person with the eye contact, with a smile, with the thoughtful remembering the person when uh, uh, they are maybe disconnected, but you send them a note. This is a lot more work than a handshake. And before you suggest that surely video conferencing calls are personal enough, after all, you are seeing each other, forget it. You can't make eye contact. Distractions are ruinous to building a connection. And increasingly, people are fed up with communicating this way. The old school telephone, now you're talking. The phone call allows you to focus on tone, pauses, size, all of the all of the, all of those rich uh, audio signals. So is this is this effort to keep us apart making us more personal in our interactions? I don't know. 
She's right to hesitate. There are too many examples of less than generous behavior now. Get out, loser, bro. Consider the angry, almost panicky shaming of a woman not wearing a mask in a grocery store. This is Karen. And the fury of another apparently called out. Maybe we aren't all in this together. There is so much fear of the other. People talking of eye contact being avoided, some even holding their breath when someone walks too close. We see each other as, each other as pariahs. Yes. So yeah. what is happening with that level of suspicion? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're not seeing people. We're seeing, like, vectors of transmission, you know? And so when we're being told that touch is dangerous, what our brain thinks is people are dangerous, others are dangerous. And I For a behavioral scientist, Laura Cavanaugh, a world in COVID is a classroom. The most curious quirk, the extremes on display, those fully doubting it's safe to be out, others behaving as if it's all over. We're under um, stress is that we have uh, something called decision fatigue. Should I wear a mask or should I not wear a mask? Does it help or does it not help? Eventually, from a psychological perspective, that just wears us out, it depletes us. And people become paralyzed or anxious or depressed, or they become reckless, self-destructive um, and, uh, and impulsive. Fear, she maintains, is pretty good at motivating short-term responses, but it doesn't motivate for long, which is possibly why medical guidelines now aren't necessarily sticking with some around the world. One of the first things that goes is psychological flexibility. And so we fall into all or nothing thinking or black or white thinking. The good news is most people are largely hardwired for resilience. And the better news, if we've all been denied the simple pleasures of a hug or a handshake for so long, when we eventually get them back, just maybe they'll mean that much more. As of this week, nearly 3 million people were tested for COVID-19 here in Canada. And as more people get screened for the virus, we take a closer look at what you need to know to arrive prepared at a testing centre. Since the start of the pandemic, only a few million Canadians have been tested for COVID-19, which means the vast majority of us don't actually know what the experience is like. So what should you expect? We encourage people to wait at least seven days before coming in and getting tested if they think they might have been exposed. When I got tested a few weeks ago, I had to wait in line for about 60 minutes. Though, of course, your experience may be very different depending on where you live, also what time of day you go. Keep in mind, the other people around you might be sick. So it's always a good idea to keep your physical distance and, of course, wear a mask. Now, while you're waiting in line, you might be given a form to fill out, just basic contact information. Once it's your turn, you'll have to answer a few more basic questions, how you're feeling, any possible symptoms you have, possible exposures. Then comes the test itself. Basically, you sit down, you take your mask off, you lean back, and the swab goes in and they'll typically swab for a few seconds just to make sure that they get a good sample. And it does go deep, but honestly, it's not so deep that it feels like it's hitting some part of your head that you didn't know existed. Uh, and it's not painful. One or two nostrils later and you're done. Staff will explain for you how you get your test results. It could be by phone. I got mine over email or you can get them yourself online. As for how long it takes to get your result, it could be in as little as 24 hours or as long as a week. It really depends on where you live. Now, one thing that you should understand, a test result is only really a snapshot in time. So people who are working in environments where they're exposed to many members of the public or through other workplace exposures should be tested regularly. So don't hesitate to come back. And anyway, it's free. He's good. Next on the National, the military's push to diversify the ranks. It's the 21st century and uh, women are in the spotlight now. Next, the behind the scenes changes to get more women on the front lines. Welcome back. The Canadian Armed Forces are trying to recruit more women, even as details are worked out for a massive class action settlement that includes victims of sexual assault and misconduct in the armed forces. So how do women feel about working there? David Common asked some of them as he looked into that recruiting. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Canadian Forces Recruiting Centre, Detachment Toronto. 
Thank you so yes, much indeed, today. this Please. is from the Times just before COVID. No distancing here, but notice that packed in among these 12 new recruits for the Canadian Armed Forces Congratulations. are five women. <laughs> Congrats, I really mean it. <laughs> Canada's military has struggled to increase women in its ranks, convincing Denise Patino, future logistics officer for the Navy, to come on board. And that's considered a win. I think there might be a lot of stigma around that, but it's the 21st century and uh, women are in the spotlight now. And I do think that the Navy and the Canadian Armed Forces are a great way for a woman to get a foot into the world and really succeed. Have fun. Thanks. Yeah, seriously, just I know you're going to be successful. Like, really, I'm so excited for you. Back before the pandemic, we met up with Molly Cameron, part of the Mighty Minority, an experienced crew woman on board a Navy ship. I've sailed with only two females out of 45 people on board, and it can be hard, you know. Um, I like hanging with the guys. I get along with them well, um, but I do think it's nice to have more females on board. The military has set a target that one in four sailors, soldiers or airmen be a woman by 2026. Today, they're way off, closer to one in seven. Better, though, than the NATO average of one in nine, still, though, short of Canada's goal. And it's barely changing. So why is it such a struggle? Charges of sexual assault against members of the military are certainly a factor. I think there may be people that fear that it's some kind of a, a predator culture, which I can, you know, I can say with my hand over my heart that it's not. So what are all the stations? Commander Michelle Tessier is among the highest ranking women in the Navy, the incoming boss of one of its newest warships. After many years of service, she's been around during dark years, but believes safety and respect are both improving. Do we have people where there are issues? Everyone does. Um, do we deal with those issues? Absolutely. Um, and do we do everything that we can to make sure that the Canadian Armed Forces is a, a welcoming environment for women and for everyone? Absolutely. I'm Shannon Busta and you're listening to For Her Country. A From a home in Toronto, host Shannon Busta is featuring the contributions of women in the military in a new podcast called For Her Country. It speaks to women from a wide array of experiences in the military at home and abroad, busting myths and shedding light about their role in the forces. I'm sure you can imagine the look on my face or what was at least going through my head when I was having these conversations. There's also the question of lifestyle for both women and men. One hurdle to military life can be the expectation to move every few years in some jobs. Sir. Hey Jason, how are you doing? Colonel Luc Sabarin runs recruiting for the forces. It's not just a woman issue, it's a cross the board issue because people really want to develop uh, their family, raise a family as a team and value the fact that their partner want to have a career as well. So it becomes a how do we work and the melody will work to ensure to minimize stress on the family. Making the military more family friendly is now a strategic goal. In some cases, moves have been reduced, postings lasting longer. Bridge ups. Speaking of family, it's how Rosalie Solomon got here, following her older sister into the Navy. Trekking three zero zero. Both are now considering joining the regular force. And their younger sister continue report. is following too. Roger, continue report. I was not really concerned. My older sister told me that it was good. People were treating her good also. So you're you're a sailor before a woman or a man. Molly Cameron was just about to head out across the Atlantic, confident in her shipmates, but sometimes still taking questions from friends. You know, is it hard? You know, do you get a lot of sexism? And like, I definitely have in the past. I can only speak to my personal experiences. I don't get a lot. Um, my trade is male dominated. Um, so, but I think human nature, if you, you know, prove yourself and they know I can do the job just as well as a male, then there's no real sexism there because there's nothing to be sexist about. Sexism, of course, exists outside the military too, but perceptions matter and it impacts attempts to increase the number of women on ships like this, making the force's own goal of greater equity somewhat elusive. David Common, CBC News, Halifax. 
Still ahead on the national social media and internet giants are debating what to do about Hong Kong's new security law, but one app says it's out. Wildly popular video app TikTok. Why? Next. I'm Josh Block. Tomorrow on CBC's daily news podcast, Frontburner, six months after the Iranian downing of flight PS752, we speak with special advisor Ralph Goodale about Canada's role in getting justice for the families of victims. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Protesters in Hong Kong have found a novel way to use signs. Now that Beijing has effectively banned certain slogans, blank pieces of paper and blank sticky notes. The message, the slogans and demands remain in their hearts. Last week, China imposed strict new security laws in the territory, and that's now caused the world's tech elite to pause. Google, Facebook and others are suspending giving data to officials. But TikTok is actually pulling out entirely. Interesting because a wildly popular app headquartered in the U.S. has Chinese ownership. Eli Glasner unpacks it all. To be honest, I, I kind of feel like a sense of irony of doing a PhD in privacy law now because there is none left in Hong Kong. And this activist is worried about Beijing's new national security law that give police the power to silence and track users. They can have a sense like who are the closest beings like in my circle and they can target those person as well. Worries about China using their data is behind the decision of Twitter and other tech giants to suspend giving it out. But things are even trickier for TikTok because of who owns it. Last week, India banned it in a purge of Chinese mobile apps. Now Australia is considering the same. We're very concerned uh, about foreign interference. And yesterday, this from the U.S. Secretary of State. Would you recommend that people download that up on their phones? Only if you want your private information in the hands of the Chinese Communist Party. In a statement to CBC News, TikTok notes the company is led by an American CEO and has never provided user data to the Chinese government. Their server is in the U.S. and in Singapore. So all of the data for TikTok is in um, outside of China. Um, but again, there's always the fear um, in the background that because they are wholly owned by a Chinese entity, that something could happen. If the U.S. takes away TikTok... It's On the platform, TikTokers were still coming to terms with the possible ban. I don't understand. I don't understand. I think clearly what the White House is trying to do is to shift um, people's focus to China, uh, given the bad... Um, press they're getting, you know, on COVID. This author COVID. says the White House may want to shift focus, but the two are tied together. A Chinese uh, company owns uh, one of the biggest pork producers in the U.S. Should you not use Smithfield Farms, which, you know, will get your, um, you know, your credit card information just as much as TikTok will. TikTok. With or without TikTok, he says cut out China and you give other countries an advantage. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. Next on The National, a moment one Nova Scotia family will never forget. Just blown away. I mean, we've been in a total tailspin the last two weeks. After a terrible accident, a community shows up with a major surprise right after this. Abby Falkenham and her dad were heading home on their motorcycles when she was hit head on by a car. She's OK, but there's a long recovery ahead of her. And while she's been in the hospital, her Nova Scotia community banded together and snuck into her family's farmhouse. What were they up to? Well, that's our moment. My daughter and I were in a very serious motorcycle accident on, uh, on June 19th. And she's got a very long road ahead of her, but she's still with me. My colleagues in the fire department came and <laughs> snuck in and uh, tackled this and blitzed everything that was left, piled the whole bit. Nah. They came in and, and cleaned out some our uh, horse stall and sheep stall. <laughs> they line trimmed all around the whole property. I mean, the community dropped off uh, a freezer full of meals, like not meals to come in and put in our freezer. They actually have a deep freeze that they drove up the driveway with a tractor and it's in our mudroom now full of meals. People just have been uh, so kind, so generous, and figuring things out. When I'd seen this, and I'm like totally reduced to tears, 
um, I'm like, yeah, this is this is our community. This is uh, this is what I know of Colchester and rural Nova Scotia. Everyone chips in and and gets things done. And, yeah, we don't know what we need, but people are figuring it out for us. That they are. So the doctor said that the, that crash could have been unsurvivable, but you know, Abby's in the hospital. She is recovering. She's also a junior member of the fire department, which made you know those acts of kindness that much more special. And her mom said she didn't know how to thank everybody, but she figures bringing her home. Uh, is thanks enough, and she's right. That is a national for Tuesday, July 7th, tonight.